Hello, I'm Derek Walker, the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church. Welcome back to our series as we go through the Psalms. And we have now reached Psalm 59. And uh, we're going to uh, yeah, just look at the setting for this psalm by looking at the title of it. It says, Psalm 59 to the chief musician. And then it says, set to do not destroy. And uh, we've talked about this before. There's been some recent psalms of the same title. I think uh, it is, could be read as, do not let me be destroyed. Um, in other words, this, as we're going to see, the background to this psalm is David fleeing from Saul. And, and that's true about the background of a number of psalms that we've seen. And so part of David's prayer is really, Lord, don't let me be destroyed. Um, and um, it's then called a michtam of David. And this is the fourth out of five michtams. And some people say that that means golden. Uh, others say it means engraved. We could perhaps combine those ideas even and say that there's, in a way, God specially underlining these psalms as, as being very precious, as being golden, that, we, that, the, that what we need to learn from these psalms need to be engraved in our hearts. And then we're actually given the historical setting for the psalm. We're not always given a historical setting, but sometimes... Uh, it's given and, and it's great when that happens. It says, when Saul sent men and they watched the house in order to kill him. And we're going to go now to see the setting of this psalm to 1 Samuel chapter 19. And actually, this is the very beginning of, of David being on the run from Saul. All right, this now introduced him into a new uh, life. You know, the background of this is that Saul had been anointed king, but because of Saul's rebellion against God, through Samuel, God announced to Saul, I'm going to replace you with another one. And, and Saul was never going to be the king, actually, because he was, for a start, from the wrong tribe. The, the kingly tribe is Judah. Uh, and that had been prophesied beforehand in Genesis 49, verse 10. Um, and so and David kills Goliath, and then he becomes a general in, in the army, and uh, really everything David touches turns to gold. He has great success, uh, uh, he is praised. And Saul now, it says actually in 1 Samuel 18, 12, now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. And so David was, was, was never done anything bad against Saul. He respected his authority, but Saul now got jealous and envious and was now afraid of David that he's going to start taking over. And also the people around, because David was the golden boy, all the other people around, the soldiers and the generals, many of them, I think, got de jealous of David, and they started accusing David, making false accusations to Saul, and Saul swallowed that up because that gave him an excuse to go after David. And so even before this event, Saul had tried to kill David a number of times. Uh, but in this occasion now, in uh, 1 Samuel 19, Saul's intention to kill David came out into the open, and so David has no ch choice but to flee. We're going to read 1 Samuel 19 from verse 8, and it says, There was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines, struck them with a mighty blow, and they fled from him. So you might think that's good, but that just reinforced Saul's fear of David rising and rising. Uh, and so in that moment, Saul opened his heart to this evil spirit that was working in his life. It says, Now the distressing or evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in the house with his spear in his hand. So now, to full of this en envy and jealousy and, and ang anger against David, he opens the door to this evil spirit. And as David was playing music with his hand, 
Then sought, Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he slipped away from Saul's presence, and he drove the spear into the wall. So David fled and escaped that night. So this was the last straw, really, that Saul tried to, to murder David while he was ministering to Saul with the harp. And, um, and so David was quick to react and flee that night. And then this, uh, the next verse is described, the context for this psalm. Remember it says when Saul sent men and watched the house where David lived in order to kill him. And so this is it here, verse 11, 1 Samuel 19, 11. Saul also sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. So here... Saul's kind of unleashed his dogs, as it were, to surround the house. And also, we learn from the psalm, be positioned in different places around the city just to make sure now that David gets killed. And so their plan was, wait, wait, to wait, watch him and then kill him in the morning and go into the house in the morning and kill him. And then they'll probably make up some story that... He died somehow during the night. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. Michael was Saul's daughter, actually, and so she knew her dad. <laughs> and so she warned David, you're going to be killed. And so um, this is the moment now that this psalm was written. David now is, is in the house. He's surrounded by Saul's men who are lying in wait to kill him. And he, he knows his days are numbered. So what does he do? He turns to the Lord and he does so in this psalm. And as he, as he does this psalm to the Lord, the Lord gives him a plan, which he puts into practice with his wife. And that's where we find out in verse 12. So Michael let David down through a window so obviously they had the the doors covered but obviously there was an opportunity to go down through a window uh, do you remember Rahab and also the apostle Paul uh, escaped in that way and he went and fled and escaped and Michael to buy David some time this was part of the plan that God gave them to buy some time it says that Michael took an image this is an idol actually um, and laid it in the bed and put a cover of goat's hair for his head and covered it with clothes. So she made it look like David was there lying in the bed under the covers. And so when Saul sent messengers, so at dawn probably, six o'clock in the morning, the messengers came, went to take David, she said, he's sick. You know, you can't take him now, he's sick. Um, he can't possibly take do the journey. Um, and so that bought David a bit more time to escape. And then Saul sent the messengers back. To, so they went back to Saul and gave that report. And then Saul sent them back. And you see how desperate he is to kill David. Bring him, and he says, bring him up to me in the bed that I may kill him. So just carry the bed to me and then I'll kill him personally. And when the messengers had come in, of course, then they discovered there was the image in the bed with a cover of goat's hair for his head. And then Saul said to Michael, why have you deceived me like this and sent my enemy away so that he's escaped? You know, Saul, <laughs> he wants everyone to feel sorry for him. He's the, he's the one doing the violence. But he, he, you'll see this a number of times. He's, he always plays the victim. Why, why have you deceived me like this? Well, she is David's wife. And Michael answered Saul, and he said to me, let me go, why should I kill you? That's probably the cover story that they had agreed together that, um, to, to, so that Michael wouldn't get uh, into trouble. And so in verse 18, David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done for him. And so that is the start now of David's life as a fugitive He'd done nothing wrong, but now, and this is going to go on for 10 years, all right? Already Saul's tried to kill him a few times, and, and he will continue to try and kill him, and the whole uh, of his army is at Saul's disposal to, to, to kill David. And for the next 10 years, he is, um, you know, living this life 
as a fugitive under threat of death. Uh, before he ultimately, before Saul dies, and then he rises to be king. But actually, this is the first of these psalms that are, have this as a background, because this is when his life of a fugitive began. And and so, um, we, it is also a messianic psalm, because the life of David is a type of the life of Christ, the greatest son of David. And we're going to see in the same way, Christ had enemies that were out to kill him. And these enemies were were not Gentiles. These were the Jewish establishment, like Saul's court. The Jewish establishment, again, uh, he had come to bless them. Jesus had done nothing wrong, and yet he was falsely accused, and he was uh, they ganged up on him to, to kill him. So you have a real parallel. And so just like Jesus for many years was under this attack so david for many years was under this attack before he was exalted and of course eventually jesus was resurrected and exalted and his is as king praise god on god's throne so you see the parallel there and and so jesus like david was innocent yet he had vicious enemies uh, and we'll see that jesus like David in this psalm, sang praises to God even when he was under threat. Praise God. That's what Jesus did, by the way, at the Last Supper. Mark Mark 14, 26, it says that Jesus sang hymns there in the Last Supper, even though he knew he was about to face uh, his, his enemies. All right. Well, there's, this is uh, what do we learn from this psalm? And we'll move quite quickly through it because it's, it's got 17 verses. But in particular, that we see David trusting in God's love, God's steadfast love, his chassid love. That's mentioned a number of times, verse 10, verse 16, verse 17. And he's trusting in God for protection. Um, and he will use a certain word, which is like in verse 1, he says, defend me. And then in other verses, verse 9, 16, and 17, he talks about God being his defense. And this word is really the word for a high tower. When he says, God, defend me, he's saying, Lord, raise me up within your high tower so that I am above and out of reach of the enemies. And when he calls God his defense, he's really saying, God, you're my high tower. Praise God. And I am above their reach and i can look down and see their defeat praise god and so we also we may not have the same kind of dangers that david goes through but we need to trust god as our defense as our high tower even against spiritual enemies demons as well as even people perhaps we need to run uh, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are safe. Praise God. All right, so let's uh, consider now the psalm. It's in two parts that are parallel to each other. I just mentioned this. You can check this out yourself. The first nine verses I'm calling God the Deliverer, and the last few, um, from verse 10 to 17, God the Judge, because his prayer moves from God delivering him to God judge them. Um, and these two parts end, uh, have, are quite parallel to each other. Um, they both end in the same refrain, a very similar refrain. That means something that's repeating, and that tells us the structure of the psalm. So verse 9, where he says, I will wait for you, O God, my strength, uh, for God is my defense. And then in verse 17, to you, all my strength, I'll sing praises, for God is my defense. Very similar. And that tells you the structure of the psalm is in two halves. And uh, moreover, there's structure within each half. Each half has a cella. So after verse 5 and after verse 13, there's a cella, which gives a break within the psalm. And then immediately after each cella, he describes... Uh, his enemies as dogs. Um, so again, we'll, you'll see that the two halves of the Psalms are, are quite um, a parallel, but there's a movement from the first half to the second half 
because he moves from uh, to greater confidence. So by the end of the psalm, he is singing praises and rejoicing in God because he knows God has heard him and will deliver him. All right, that's that's the structure of the psalm. So let's now get into the psalm itself. The first nine verses, God the, the deliverer. Verse 1, deliver me from my enemies, O, God, o my God, the, or rescue me from my enemies, O my God. Remember, he's holed up in the house, and he's surrounded by these men who are out to, with orders to kill him. And he says, O my God. You know, in the world, sadly, a lot of people, they use that, don't they? OMG, O my God, but they don't know God at all. But what it really means is, Oh my God, he has a personal relationship with God. He has a covenant with God and he's calling on God. And so if you say, oh my God, make sure you're doing it truly to God. Oh my God, I'm calling on you. And then he says, deliver me. And then he says, defend me, defend me or protect me. And and this is the word that I've talked about. It literally means set me on high in your high tower. Lord, set me on high in your high tower, out of reach of those who rise up against me, he says. They're rising up against me. But Lord, I want you to raise me up above them in your high tower, where I'm safe. Praise God. And then verse 2, he says again, deliver me or rescue me from the workers of iniquity. And, And I want you to notice that these people he describes is not just his personal enemies, they are enemies of God. They are workers of iniquity. They know that what Saul is doing is wrong. They know that David's the anointed one, that God's hands on him, but it's inconvenient to them because they want the power, they want the wealth, they want, and and so they um, are workers of iniquity. They are enemies of God. And let me just say this, there's more going on in David's life than just really just would be with a normal person. Because David understood he had a special place in God's plan, God's purposes. Israel as a whole had a special place because God had ordained through Israel that all the families of the earth would be blessed. Because through Israel, the Messiah would come and he would bring salvation to the whole world. And also he would become the king over the whole world and reign from Israel over the whole world. And that's still to happen. And David understood that the Messiah was the fulfillment of prophecies and that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. And David knew that as he was the first king in that tribe of Judah, he was the forerunner for the Messiah. And he knew that he was God's anointed, God's chosen, and that he was at the middle of God's plan, not just for Israel, but for all humanity. And therefore, these attacks coming against him were not just natural attacks. They they were satanic attacks. This was the kingdom of darkness here pulling, um, you know, using Saul as a puppet, really, to actually, because we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And so there was the whole kingdom of darkness was trying to stop David, trying to destroy David, just as they tried to destroy Christ, because they knew that he was the chosen king that would actually mark their end and their doom. And so David's, and this comes through in the psalm, that David understands there's bigger things going on than just his personal life and his personal safety. It really mattered that God would deliver him and rescue him. Otherwise, God's plan would be thwarted. And so he, he prays a very strong prayer, deliver me from the workers of iniquity, the, who are enemies of God. He's asking God to get involved because they're they're not just David's enemies. They're the enemies of God. And he says, and save me from bloodthirsty men. These are men of blood. This means they are intent on shedding blood. They are planning to murder David. And so God asks, in the first two verses, he asks God to deliver him in a very urgent way. You know, you can sense the urgency. Deliver me, defend me deliver me you know and uh, when the advantage of of having problems is they should drive you to God (laughs) 
you know, sometimes when everything's easy, we're, we're, we're less likely to go to God because we don't feel the need. But David certainly feels the need. And then he gives the basis for his prayer, the basis for confidence that God's going to answer his prayer. The be- and, and also, as it were, he gives God reasons why he should answer this prayer. In other words, it's not just an emotional appeal. David actually grounds his prayer in truth. And so, he, verse 3, first of all, he describes the situation. Of course, God knows, but it's all right to tell God what you're going through. You don't have to spend too long doing that, but it's all right laying it out before God. That's what he does. He says, for look, God, look, look, they lie in wait for my life. That's the present reality. They're setting an ambush for him. The mighty, or we could say the fierce, violent men, the mighty, the fierce, violent men, gather against me, could stir up strife against me. They're gathered against me. So God, look, God, you're in danger. Um, I'm in danger. And and I like what one uh, missionary said once uh, when he was in danger. He said, Lord, your property is in danger. <laughs> Lord, do something because I'm in danger and I'm, I'm, I belong to you. And then secondly, he gives another basis for his prayer, and that is his innocence. The second part of verse 3. Yet not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. In other words, David is saying, Lord, I'm innocent. I have done nothing to provoke this. I am innocent. He's not, of course, claiming to be Mr. Perfect. But as far as this situation, he was innocent of treason against Saul. They were actually persecuting David because he, because of what he did right, rather than what he did wrong. It was because of the jealousy that uh, Saul and these other men had against him. And so that's all right to pray that. If you are truly innocent of an accusation, it's all right to, to claim your innocence. All right? You're not claiming to be perfect, but you you know it's different. If you have sinned, and, and Peter com- in the New Testament confirms this, you can suffer for your sin, you know, if you've sinned and you've brought this on yourself, that's rather different. You need to confess your sin. But if you are suffering for righteousness, for doing the right thing, then you you can pray on that basis and and use that as part of your prayer, that you are innocent in this situation. And then he says, verse 4, They run and prepare themselves through no fault of mine. Again, he's saying, there's nothing that I have done. But notice he describes them. They're energetic. And they are preparing themselves or they're positioning themselves to, to do evil. So he describes them. They're all, you know, it's kind of like uh, a, a squad of uh, crack police who who are surrounding a house. And they, they prepare themselves. They position themselves. And they're moving around into position to to get him. And and yet he says, through no fault of mine. And so he's feeling the urgency of his prayer, and that's why suddenly he he breaks the normal flow of the poetry in verse 4 to make an urgent appeal. He says, so God, awake to help. Help me, and behold, look, behold, look at my what I'm suffering. And awake to help me also could mean uh, be present, with me come to meet me is another translation get involved god in my situation i'm inviting you god lord they they're too strong for me in the natural you know you have to invite god into the situation because if you decide you're just going to handle this yourself god will fold his arms as it were and let you get on with it but if you call on him and invite him into the situation and say god oh you know come to my help uh see what I'm facing, come to my help, invite God into the situation, then he will, because you've humbled yourself and you've asked for his help. All right, and then in verse 5, he gives another basis for uh, his confidence that God is going to, um, and and another appeal, if you like, to, to, uh, to God as to why God should get involved in this situation and in this case he piles up 
names of God. He's calling on God's nature and the fact that he's a covenant he's in covenant with God and God is a covenant keeping God. That's the basis for his faith really. Not just his need but the fact that God is has made promises and God is faithful. And so he says therefore you therefore O Lord and that's Yahweh which means the covenant keeping God Yahweh God of hosts that hosts means armies he's the god of the angelic armies who's got all the angels at his disposal he's saying um the god of israel and and so he's calling on god uh and the god of israel he's part of israel so he has a covenant with god and so he's basing his prayer in the nature of god the names of god and he says therefore O lord god of hosts god of israel awake Rise up to punish all the nations. Now, this is kind of unusual. The word nations, goyim, normally refers to Gentiles, to the heathen. But in this case, David is facing Jewish Jewish persecutors. And uh, I think on, from David's point of view initially, uh, this word goyim actually is people who have no covenant relationship with God. So although they're Jews, they're acting like enemies of God. They are enemies of God. Remember, Jesus said to the Jewish leaders in John 8, you are of your father the devil. You think Abraham's your father, maybe he is in the flesh, but you are of your father the devil. And so he is describing them as people who, although physically they're Jews, they are they are enemies of God. And he is saying, God, punish, punish them. But his prayer, and, and, he, and why punish them? And then he goes on and says, do not be merciful to, do not favor any wicked transgressors. And this word for wicked transgressors is also wicked apostates, uh, traitors against God's cause. So again, the, this is in, in the in the context. These these are Jews, but they're apostate. They have rejected God. They are traitors against God's cause, which was centered on David. And so, he is asking God to deal with these enemies because they actually threaten the plan and the purpose of God. And and so, but again, we get a glimpse here that he is aware that it's not just his situation because he prays punish all punish all the goyim punish all the heathen you might say in other words he's looking into the future that he is just one case but he understands he's asking god to get involved in his situation but he's also praying if you like on a bigger scale because this is also the prayer of Christ, the Messiah. Um, this is a prayer that God will deal with all the wicked transgressors, all those who have purposefully, as it were, given themselves over to evil, who have purposefully uh, rejoiced in evil, that there is a day coming when, when God is going to wait, rise up and punish all the evildoers. So there is a prayer this is also a prayer like we pray, thy kingdom come, that God will ultimately rise up, you know, and and judge all the evil transgressors. Uh, and so God often will wait till somebody's evil has come to its fullness when they have made their f final decision for evil rather than God, and then they will be judged. And so this is a, and this is the case of these these. These people trying to kill David, they had given themselves over to, to evil. So David isn't just praying for this, his local situation. He is praying the general prayer, you know, that God is going to punish all evildoers, all those who are wicked transgressors. All right. And then the first five verses now are concluded with a selah. It's kind of like a pause. It's kind of like think on that. And then the, the psalm is going to move into a, in, into a different direction. So it's kind of like a bit of a full stop. Now, in the next verses, he is going to describe 
these these enemies who are out to kill him as dogs. Um, now, normally, <laughs> dogs, and there are cases in the Bible where dogs is used as a word of insult against the Gentiles. But as I said, um, the Bible does also um, up, the Bible also does you know use the word uh, dog to to actually describe you know I, I think David used it like for Goliath you know um, so it's used as an insult for Gentiles but it can be used as well for Jews who are essentially God rejectors those who do not have covenant with God and so in this case he describes these Jewish attackers from Saul as as being like dogs in their nature they're they're not saved and they are consumed by their uh, their their lusts their appetites and we've got to when we talk about the word dog <laughs> we tend to think of our cute pet dogs but the dogs that he's talking about that would happen in those times they would tend to come out more in the uh, night time but these would be wild dogs that would hunt in packs and in some cities you'd have this more often um, they are scavengers they come out at night and they are dangerous garbage disposers or in other words these crack troops of Saul he describes them as Saul's Saul's guard dogs as it were and they are you know quite nasty and vicious and it would be dangerous sometimes to go out at night because of these prowling dogs looking for something to eat. And so um, this is the description of these ones as dogs. Again, because they're not spiritual, they're not uh, of God, they are in rebellion against God. They are men of the flesh, you might say. So here it is, verse 6, at evening they return. So again, that's what happened. David was at home. He had escaped from Saul, but now here they come. And they come and they are, it says, they growl or they snarl menacingly like a dog. And they go all around the city. So these are Saul's men surrounding his house, also all around the city, just to make sure David can't escape. And uh, we're going to see these dogs again in verse 14. And then it says, <laughs> indeed, they belch with their mouth. It's a funny translation. The word means to bubble up, bursting out, overflowing. Um, it, it really means that they are spewing out evil words. Um, they're foaming at the mouth like dogs foaming at the mouth. They, they, are, they are a stream of wicked words are flowing out of their mouth. Um, and then it says swords are in their lips. In other words, their lips are spilling out, cutting accusations against David and speaking words of violence, talking about what they're going to do with David because they're so, they hate him um, and they're envious of him. For and then even worse is what is their blasphemy against God. So it says, For they say, Who hears? For they say, Who hears? What they're saying is, it is in their heart, they have no fear of God. They, they think, Oh, nobody can hear us. Nobody is kind of like, We're going to do this under the cover of darkness. Nobody knows what we're up to. You know, we, we can sin like this. And nobody will find out. Do you know every time that Satan uh, tempts someone to sin, there is always that deception with the temptation is no one will find out. You'll get away with it. And that, and that helps you do the sin. And, and so in there is this idea that, that God won't, won't know about it or he won't be interested. You'll, you'll get away with it. And remember, Satan is, is a liar. And so th when they say who hears, they are really speaking against God. They're basically saying God is irrelevant. God won't, won't take any notice of what we're doing. Uh, David's got no chance. We're going to be able to kill him. 
who hears? Nobody knows what we're up to. It's a, it's a denial of God, really. They have no fear of God. They have no realization that God is watching and God's going to hold them to account. It's a, it's a rejection of God. And so that's what makes them guilty. By the way, we talked about this word dogs. Jews did call Gentiles dogs sometimes, but also Paul called some Jewish people dogs. <laughs> and, and he turned it on in Philippians 3.2. He says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. These were Jewish leaders uh, who were trying to force the, Je- the Christian, con- the Gentile converts to be circumcised because they were legalists and they were trying to put Christians under the law. Paul did not like that and he called them dogs, which really means they're not saved. They're, they're men of the flesh. It's the, probably the biggest insult a Jew could use for another Jew. You know, he says they're, they're as just like the heathen, spiritually. For he says, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. Um, you see, so he is, he is saying that dogs are those who are outside the covenant of God. And, and they might be Jewish dogs as well as Gentile dogs. All right, so they are saying, remember verse 7, they are saying, who hears? Who notices what we're doing? We're going to get away with this. But then God turns up now. Now, at this point, David has a revelation. God shows him, yes, God does hear, and God's going to respond. And verse 8 is a very striking verse, and this is where David starts to really get confidence because he says, but, but you, O Lord, shall laugh at them. You will have all the nations, the, the goyim, the, all of these people who aren't in covenant with God. You will have them in derision. By the way, that's just like Psalm 2.4, where it talks about all the nations are stirred up in rebellion against the Lord and his anointed. And then it says, the Lord who sits in heaven shall laugh them to scorn. And, and what that, what that means is he is, uh, they kind of, God is saying, how can they be so foolish to think that they can rebel against me and get away with it, that they can act in an evil way and, and, and somehow they'll succeed. It's a kind of a laugh at their foolishness. It's, It's a sorrowful laugh because he's sad that they have chosen the path of evil. But he does laugh at their foolishness because they have no chance in their rebellion against God. And so man feels strong, you know, in the moment when he says evil things about against God. But God will will have the last laugh. And um, and so the he, God says, even though they dismiss God as irrelevant, he says, verse 8, but you, O Lord, you will laugh at them. You will have all nations in derision. So again, David looks to his immediate situation and he sees God is much stronger than these people. They are weaklings compared to God. God's going to give David the victory in this situation and he's looking not beyond this situation he's saying all the nations all the peoples of the earth who are in rebellion against God God laughs at that rebellion and ultimately God's victory will be seen through the Messiah over all the nations of the earth so David is is knows a lot more he's he is aware as Christ was aware of his calling and his destiny to to rule the world. So David was aware of the bigger issues at work uh, and that this was actually part of a great spiritual cosmic warfare, that his life was actually an important part of, of the outworking of God's plan. All right, so now we've come to the end of the first section with verse 9, which is the refrain which brings this part to its conclusion and where he says, I will wait for you, O Lord. Uh, Sorry, I will wait for you or I will watch for you. Now, this is very important because Jesus said, watch and pray. You know, why does he say watch and pray? Because there are two parts in your praying. You are saying, 
Yes, you're talking to God in your praying. You know, you're telling God uh, and asking God and thanking God. But also it's important as well as talking to God that you let God talk to you. That's what watching means. So in other words, you are praying, but also you are watching to he- and looking to, to see and to hear what God might say to you. So when he says, I will watch for you, this is David on his knees by his bed as they are laying in wait to kill him. And he's saying, God, I'm watching for you. I'm looking to you to show me the escape route. Because, Lord, you always have a way of escape. So I'm looking to you for wisdom and for guidance. And so he says, I'm I'm watching for you. Praise God. And, and, oh, you, he says, oh, you, his strength. Now, that doesn't make sense. It should be uh, retranslated as, oh, you my strength lord you're my strength and i'm looking to you to save me in this situation for and then he says again this classic statement for god is my defense remember in verse one he had said lord i want you to be please be my defense please be my high tower now he has appropriated uh that and he says, for God is my defense. God is my high tower. He has put his trust in God as his high tower. He, and now he is waiting for God to show him the way out of this uh, situation. Praise God. And this was the prayer of Jesus too. As the enemies tried to kill him, he was waiting and watching on God to lead him step by step and trusting in God as his defense, as as his high tower. Praise God. All right. And so now we're in the second part, uh, which is which is a bit shorter. And this is where the, the prayer gets more imprecatory, which means that he is praying uh, for God to be the judge over these enemies. And not just these enemies, like I said, to be the judge against all evil and wickedness, in, for, in all the kingdom of darkness, He prays for God to bring them into judgment. And so let's look at verse 10. He says, my God of mercy. So he starts this section with a revelation that God loves him. He's trusting in the love of God, the mercy of God. This word mercy is the word uh, chassid. It's translated steadfast love. Could say grace. God's covenant love. My God of steadfast love. I, or I would prefer, my God who loves me. Lord, you're the God who loves me. I'm trusting in your love. My God of mercy shall come to meet me. Now, what does this word meet? The word meet here means a kind of God coming in, into my very presence, meeting me. It means it could be translated two two ways. It could mean that God comes and we have face to face fellowship with God, or and it also mean can mean my God will go before me. Either way, God is filling my my vision, and so let's let's go with the the latter. It says, "My God of mercy shall come to meet me or go before me." In other words, He's going to come. And he's going to take my hand. He's, uh, he's going to lead me uh, to safety. Praise God. He's going to move me forward in his plan. So he's confident now. And, and my, I would prefer this translation of verse 10. My God shall come to meet me with his loving kindness. See, the word mercy is loving kindness. My God shall come to meet me with his loving kindness and he will go forth uh, and and his loving kindness will, will lead me to safety. Praise God. And then verse 10, part, second part says, God shall let me see my desire on my enemies. Uh, I don't like that translation because my desire is not there in the original. So it, it really just says, God will let me see on my enemies or look on my enemies. And really what it means is 
God will let me see the downfall of my enemies. All right? The downfall of his enemies. Or God will let me look in triumph over my enemies. And so, uh, verse 11, he is now praying the, for God's judgment on these enemies, for God to deal with the enemies. But it's an interesting prayer in verse 11. He says, do not slay them. Do not slay them, lest my people forget. So now he's saying, do, do not. In other words, he doesn't want them just to die. All right? Uh, lest my people forget. Now, he wants, uh, in other words, he w doesn't want, uh, he, he wants them to be an object lesson. You see, some judgments of God are object lessons to the, to the whole human race and to the people of God. Sodom and Gomorrah, Noah's flood. You know, they are used as object lessons that we would learn from them and, and that the people of God would learn from them. Uh, now, for example, if, for instance, they were killed immediately, they were, if, if imagine Saul was killed immediately uh, in answer to David's prayer, uh, then we would have forgotten Saul by now. He'd just be a little footnote in history. He would have very little, we wouldn't really learn much from Saul. But because he did not slay, he didn't die immediately, uh, as a result, the judgment of God, if you like, the, and the, re the, the reaping of his sin uh, played itself out over, t over 10 years. And so that he becomes an object lesson to us. Um, he, we can see through the life of Saul what sin is like and, and, and how it leads to your downfall and, and how you know, it leads to you being uh, ashamed, really, a disgrace. And again, if, the, if Saul, if the judgment was too quick, then nobody would learn much from from that judgment so david is aware that he uh, god's judgments are actually designed to teach people especially the people of god that to teach people about god and about sin and about you know how to live and so he, it's an interesting prayer but he says do not slay them lest my people forget in other words he wants the people of god to learn from the you know how it doesn't work out in Saul's life. Another example is when Cain killed Abel, God didn't suddenly slay Cain. Instead, Cain was wandering in in a, a desolate place uh, for many years, hundreds of years possibly, because then Cain would be an object lesson. This is what happens to to murderers. Uh, whereas if Cain died, he'd be very quickly forgotten. So this is the concept that God's judgments are actually exemplary. They are meant to be examples to all of us of the consequences of sin. And so David understands that it's better if the judgment takes time to work itself out. And then he says, scatter them by your power. And, and it probably be better translated, let them be wanderers by their power. In other words, this is a, a judgment that works itself over time. And, and the, you know, this is messianic too, because Saul's court, as it were, uh, Israelite court, is a picture of the Sanhedrin, who, who were enemies of the greater than David. The, son, the greater son of David. And in the same way, the judgment came on Israel for rejecting her Messiah, putting him to death and, and, and rejecting him. Even though God would have accepted their repentance, they didn't repent. And as a result, Israel was scattered to the nations. They became wanderers. And this is, in a sense, the answer to that prayer, that they would... Uh, have to learn the lesson the hard way. And through Israel's wandering among the nations for almost 2,000 years, that is to teach us and to teach Israel, you know, that they have sinned and that they need to recognize that and, and turn back to God. 
but that God's judgments are exemplary. And this is worked out in a bit. This prayer was answered in a bigger way in the judgment on Israel. Um, but God always, you know, part of God's plan is that because judgments played itself out over time, that gives people a chance to repent. It, people to learn from your downfall, but also <laughs> chance for you to repent and get back to God before it's too late. All right. And then he prays in verse 11, and bring them down. In other words, humble them. Humble them. And that certainly happened to Israel. O Lord, our shield. And uh, he, again, he is looking to God to be his shield, to be between him and his enemies. But notice, for the Lord to be your shield, you, that's the word add-on. In other words, calling him Lord means I'm submitting to your authority. If you want God to be your shield, you must submit to God and put yourself under him. Then he will cover you and he will be your shield. And then he describes their sin again. Why they should face this judgment is very much because of their evil words. Verse 12, for the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride or captured in their pride, snared in their pride, trapped in their pride for the cursing and lying which they speak. So in their proud rebellion against God, will actually pride brings a downfall they'll be trapped in their pride they'll be their sin will be exposed and they will be caught in a trap they will reap what they sow verse 13 again it doesn't contradict verse 11 because he is saying don't do it immediately god but let it work out in its in its right timing but of course if they don't repent then judgment must mean that they do come to their end there is a final judgment there is a there is a god god will not allow evil to continue and david is is praying that that it, they will be dealt with in the end consume them in wrath or literally end them in wrath consume them or end them that they may be no more and so this judgment will work itself out until it crosses the line, and of course, Saul and the others died. Hopefully, some of them did repent. And then it says, and let them know that God rules in Jacob to the ends of the earth. And I, I notice this, first of all, that God, David's motivation in this prayer, even though it's a strong prayer, he's praying for God's glory. He, his motivation is he's concerned for God's glory. And it could mean as it's translated, that God rules in Jacob to the ends of the earth. I suppose that would be a picture of the fact that God, God's plan is to rule the nations, all the nations, from Jacob, from Israel. Um, you know, that, 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 that is God's plan. But it makes more sense, really, to connect the ends of the earth to the knowing. In other words, let them know to the ends of the earth that God rules in Jacob that there's a God in Israel. In other words, so he's praying that God will intervene in such a way that the ends of the earth, the whole world, will, will know. See, David again had this vision. He knew from Abraham's covenant that God's purpose for Israel is for blessing to go to the whole world and for the Messiah of Israel to rule the whole world. He understood that. And so he understood that he had an important part of that. Somehow he understood, God made him to understand that even the events of his life and these psalms and so on will one day bring the knowledge of God to the ends of the earth. And that not that true? We read the Bible stories of David and the psalms and, and we are from the ends of the earth. And, and so that knowledge has come to us through, through Christ. And so this is David's prayer that all the ends of the earth will know that God rules in Jacob. In other words, that the God of Israel is the true God, and he is the sovereign God, and he rules over all. And God's judgments, and, and in the future as well, will be demonstrations to the whole world that the God of Israel is still alive. 
and he is the sovereign God. And this is David's prayer, for God to be exalted among the nations. And he knew somehow that his, his exaltation, his deliverance, would actually be part of a bigger plan that would lead to the fact that God would be exalted in all the world. If David wasn't delivered, then the plan of God would, would have been destroyed because the Messiah had to come from David. All right. And he actually prayed a similar thing when he faced Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, 46. He says, I'm, I'm going to dis- destroy you, Goliath. <laughs> uh, and that all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel. See, that's on David's heart. He wanted God to be glorified to the ends of the world. It's an amazing vision that he had, that God had given him. And he knew that his life somehow was part of that. All right. And so let them know. He wants the nations to know that there is a God, the God of Israel, and he will hold men accountable for their sin. And then there's the Selah again, the Selah. And, and this is just a, a pause, in, and now it moves on. As in the first part of the psalm, the Selah is followed by the description of these dogs. He goes back to these dogs, but with a different twist. Verse 14, and at evening they return. They growl like a dog. Or that this again is the word could be snarl, or it could even be the word murmur, like the Israelites murmured in the wilderness. They were complaining um, or whining, you know. And again, this time the picture of the dogs we're going to notice is that they're, they're, before it was all menacing and very nasty. Now they're they're seen in a kind of pathetic life this light the these enemies of god are really quite pathetic they're like these 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 dogs whining and murmuring uh desperate just for a bit of food that they can find on the on the they they don't know god and so they they're desperately coveting off any scrap of food that they can get from. So they growl or they, they, they snarl or they whine like a dog and they go all around the city. Again, they prowl. So they growl and they prowl. <laughs> um, but next verse really shows how... Verse 6, by the way, is practically the, the same as verse 14. Verse 15 now, again, emphasizes this pathetic idea he sees them now through the eyes of god that how pathetic they are they wander up and down for food to consume and they howl they complain if they're not satisfied so he, he, he's these ones who were hunting david uh, as it were to consume him but really they're consumed by their lusts they're, they're desperate they're like these scavenger dogs wanting some food and they're never satisfied uh, and they're, they're howling because they can't get David and so they're, now they're howling, they're complaining because all their attempts to get the glory and get the riches from Saul and, and get the praise of Saul have come to nothing. They're unsuccessful and one possible translation is they, 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 they're, they're just not satisfied and they keep uh, and they spend the whole night, but they can't find him. And and they howl. And, and again, it's just a pathetic picture of failure. And never, never satisfying your lusts. Always, it, always that satisfaction is elusive when you are just following your flesh. And so this is a picture of these wandering dogs. And of course, this is what happened they didn't get their victim they get no food they got no reward and then he finishes now by focusing on the lord rather than his assassins he sees the assassins in a different light and now he focuses on the lord in triumphant praise and i lo- verse 16 is a but you know again it was parallel to the previous one because after describing the dogs in verse 7 he does a contrast in verse 8 by saying, But you, O Lord, you laugh them to scorn. All right, these dogs are speaking all kinds of evil. But, God, but then he says, But God, you laugh them to scorn. 
And here's another contrast now, another but, as he moves from the dogs in verse 15 to himself, actually, in verse 16. He says, the, these dogs, they're snarling, they're whining, but, but as for me, but I will sing of your power. Yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning. So he says, they, they, there's the dogs all night in the darkness. They're growling, they're murmuring, they're whining. But as for me, I will sing aloud or shout of your mercy in the morning. Praise God. And so notice he talks about God's power. He, he rejoices in God's power and he rejoices in God's mercy. That's his steadfast love, his grace, his loving kindness. And again, there's the image of the night and the morning. The dogs at night, it seemed like darkness is, is ruling everything. And, but he looks beyond the night. And here's David. He's doing this psalm at night. It seems like the dogs are the ones who have the power. But he is looking forward to the morning. And he knows that in the morning, he is going to be delivered by God. And he says, I am going to sing of your power. I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning. And so the morning symbolizes the deliverance when the light shines, when the light conquers the darkness. And so here's David. He's under threat of his life, but he, he now sees and he looks forward to the morning when he's just going to be praising God because God will have set him free from the clutches of the enemy. And this, of course, is a picture of the resurrection morning when Jesus rose from the dead. Yes, it looked like for a whole night time, as Jesus was on the cross, darkness, it looked like darkness was, like the dogs were surrounding him on the cross. In fact, that's in Psalm 22. He's in the darkness. It seems like the darkness is prevailing. But Jesus was in faith and he looked forward to the resurrection morning. And he and he he knew that God was going to deliver him. And at his resurrection, of course, he sung of God's power and of God's covenant love. He rejoiced in God in the morning. And David went through that parallel experience, you see. He he was we see in the psalm now. He is Remember, he was w waiting on the Lord. He was watching the Lord. Verse 9, God gave him the guidance and God gave him assurance that he's going to deliver him. And now he looks forward to the, to the morning when he will be able to give God triumphant praise. And then he says, for you have been my defense. For it's as good as done as far as David's concerned. You have been my defense. That's that word again, my high tower. You are my high tower. You've, I've, you've put me out of reach of my enemies. And you have been my refuge, a place where you can flee to for safety. Lord, I have fled to you, Lord, and you have kept me safe. You have been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. And now we come to the last verse, verse 17, which again is the refrain that we saw in verse 9, just with the two differences. Remember in verse 9, he talked about, I will, I will look to you, I will watch, I will wait for you, God, I'm looking to you. Um, and now he had done that, and he had received guidance, he'd received encouragement from the Lord. So now instead of saying, I wait on you, Lord, he says, to you, O my strength, I will sing praises. Hallelujah. So again, verse 9 was, I will wait for you, O my strength. And now he says, to you, O my strength, I will sing praises. Do you see the difference? Instead of wait for you, it's I will sing praises. And so he is assured of the victory. Uh, now he's prayed through as it were he's assured of the victory and he declares that he will sing praises notice he says it three times about the praises in 16 and 17 he says i will sing and then i will shout and then i will sing praises or i will raise a psalm praise god and so it the it ends with triumphant praise because god is his strength and his high tower god was his inner strength 
to empower him and rather to so that his emotions weren't overwhelmed but also god was his high tower his protection his place of safety and so um praise god david had had come through in into victory and he now entered his new life as a fugitive singing praises to god all right um so again verse 17 for to you all my strength i will sing praises for god is my defense again just like verse 9 god is my high tower hallelujah and then he adds one more phrase just to cap it all off, he says, my God of mercy, or my God of grace, or God of my steadfast love. I would like to translate that, my God, remember this word mercy is, is the word for steadfast love. My God who loves me, or the God of my loving kindness, or the God who shows me steadfast love. So he's giving glory to God. He's praising God for his love, his faithful love. And um, where this last phrase comes from, and this just to wrap this up here, remember we said this second, this psalm is in two parts. The second part starts with verse 10 by him saying, my God of mercy. And now, he finishes it by saying, my God of mercy. That's called an inclusio. He kind of bookends that second part of the psalm by emphasizing this fact that he's my God of mercy. He's the God who loves me. And so it starts with the God who loves me. And it finishes with the God who loves me. So he, he, his ultimate uh, rejoicing is in the fact that God loves him. And, and so he adds that to the refrain. At the end, he, he adds on that phrase, the God, you are the God who loves me. And he thanks God for his steadfast love. And so maybe you're being hounded by dogs. Maybe you're being afflicted in different ways. Do as David did in this psalm. Uh, turn to God. Trust him to be your protection, your high tower. Uh, out, let him put you out of reach of those enemies commit all things into his hand invite him into your situation and and pray that god will be glorified through this whole mess that god will be glorified and remember most of all that he is the god who loves you he's the god who shows you steadfast love he is your god of mercy god bless you Amen.